We start here. Who's the hardest player, in your opinion, to rank as a prospect this year? Can I give you a couple? I'll go Jared Verse. Make as many Defensive as you want end now. Florida yeah. State. Love, love, love the way he plays the game field. Jared Verse attacks. He plays hard. He hustles. Okay, we know what the powerhouse he is. He'll handle his run responsibilities. He will be a guy who plays in the NFL think, for a while and has a successful career. But is the tightness in the hips going to prevent him from being a 10-plus sack a year guy, an 8-plus sack a year guy? You're drafting him in the top 10 to 15. You want double-digit sacks out of that player, right? Will he be that guy? Will he just be a steady force, good player, but not great? So you go from 10 down to that 25 area. That's the range in terms of where he could go and ranking him very difficult. Guys that have great workout numbers but aren't productive or guys that have Average workout numbers, but we're really good on tape field. That's the problem. Chop Robinson, Penn State pass rusher, not the production. Not the production at all. They'll have two sacks against UMass, right? Mm -hmm. Not a lot of other sacks this year. You can excuse it away. We always try to excuse it away. Why wasn't it eight or nine sacks? We got, you always got to try to reconcile that because you love the workout. You love the fact that he does hustle. He does play hard. Bottom line is Chop Robinson, Penn State pass rusher, difficult to rank. N.S. Rakestraw Jr. on the flip side of that, pretty good corner at Missouri, right? With Chris Abrams drained on the other side, benefited from Darius Robinson, who's, by the way, Darius Robinson is back into the first round after his pro day. Bottom line is, though, N.S. Rakestraw Jr., no longer a first necessarily, more of a second-round pick because he didn't test great in the 4-5-1 area for that 40 time. But good player, not great test. Chop Robinson tests great but didn't have the results. Those two kids are very tough to, to put a final grade on as well. Now, you know what's funny is you and I got the same intel on Darius Robinson's pro day because someone reached out to me and said holy crap I just watched this Darius Robinson pro day and it's a crime if that kid doesn't go in the first round he had an absolutely oh, splendid day he will go in the first round he Mel, will feel Mel I've got an idea of where he will go I almost had him there in my first you know it's hard hard to make everything happen that you hear uh, I'll give you a player that's hard to rank Mel and it's continuous with our pass rush theme it's Layatu Latu and I'll just say this I will say it until April 25th it's the best defensive tape of any player in the class. It's not close. This is one of the most gifted pass rushers that I have seen in quite some time, Mel. His refinement as a rusher is terrific. He's a good athlete, not a dominant athlete. But the most important part of why this is difficult is he's got a medical red flag in some team's eyes. He was medically retired from football a few years ago. I have been told consistently that there are several teams that see no long-term concern with Layatu Latu Mel. But are those several teams the teams that could be in the top half of the draft? I don't know the answer to that. Are those several teams, teams that are picking between 25 and 32? Maybe. You just don't know. It's one of the hardest parts of the process. I love the player. I think the tape is unimpeachable. This guy is a top 10 talent in the class. But because of the medical history, I can't guarantee you he goes in the first 10 picks. All right, Mel, let's talk about something. You know, you and I are hearing all kinds of things. We're doing our best to talk to as many people on top of our own film evaluation and try to get more information here and there, here and there. Is there something that you've heard that has kind of surprised you along the way? Yeah, Matt Miller was talking about it, and others have said J.J. McCarthy second overall yeah. to the Washington Commanders over Jaden Daniels. And I called around, uh, yeah, you check, and still say, yeah, you can, and this is what I heard, you can hear that maybe Adam Peters, GM of the Washington Commanders, came from San Francisco, right, where they made a mistake with Trey Lance, right? Remember, they were lucky with Brock Purdy as Mr. Irrelevant, but Trey Lance was a major bust, third pick overall. What does Adam Peters learn? What is he, how does he view quarterback now? You have, you know, Kingsbury there as coordinator. You can really like a quarterback doesn't mean you don't like the other guy and you take the other guy. So even though they may really like, the intel may be right, that they really do like J.J. McCarthy, they like, uh, like him enough to take him over Jaden Daniels, who, as I said, you imagine him at Washington with Baltimore, with, with Lamar Jackson, that's the comp. So I just keep hearing things about J.J. McCarthy. I have the final mock coming out Wednesday. I'm still not convinced two overall is where he's going to go, but you hear it. So it's out there. Matt Miller's talked about it more than anybody, that uh, Michigan's quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, could go too. I'm not saying I'm not buying it, but I'm not convinced that's going to happen right now. I'm with you, Mel. I've talked about this a little bit in the past on the show, but I'll just continue to mention it in case it happens. The idea uh, that Chop Robinson goes in the first 15 picks, Mel. You mentioned him just a few moments ago, why the production mm -hmm. is not great, but the traits are really, really, really good. And Mel... 
My goodness, are they really, really good. Other than the length, he was 6 0 2 6, so a little shorter than some teams were expecting him to be. But that first step, Mel, I mean, you watch him and you think that you're watching a play in fast forward. Such an explosive rusher with a gifted first step. And generally speaking, pass rushers do not last long on the board, especially in a class, Mel, that we don't think stacks up to some of the recent classes that we have had. There is no Bosa, there is no. You know, last year, Aiden, or two years ago, Aiden Hutchinson, there's not that kind of prospect available in this mm -hmm. year's class. Let's talk about teams that we think could be on the move here, Mel. Uh, is there a team that you think could move up in the first round that comes to mind? Start wherever you want, and I'll fill in some gaps from there. All right, I already talked second round with maybe the Giants moving up for a quarterback in the Rams. I think the Buffalo Bills are going to be a really an interesting team because of the Stephon Diggs trade and wide receiver Josh Allen. Yeah, you have some guys they like there, led by, of course, Khalil Shakir. But do they move all the way up in the top ten to get Romo Dunze if he slides down to that eight spot, right? Do they move up? And these teams really want to move out of there, and is the compensation going to be good enough? Julio Jones, Atlanta moved up to get. From 27 to 6. They get up a lot to get him, but they acquired a great number one go to receiver, one of the best in the league in Julio Jones. Will the opportunity be afforded to the Buffalo Bills, and will they want to do that? Or will they want to move up into the mid first, right? To get an Xavier Worthy, to get an Adonai Mitchell. Do you have to move? How far do they have to move up to get Adonai Mitchell? Is it four, five, six spots? It may not have to be that quantum leap. But it may be a leap from the late first, maybe up five, six, seven spots to get the wide receiver they love, whether it's Brian Thomas Jr. And I do think he could slide down into that 20, 25 area. Or at that point, Adonai Mitchell, shorthand, he's going to catch those Josh Allen fastballs. Adonai Mitchell doesn't drop anything. Xavier Worthy, we talked about with the speed. Xavier Leggett, big bodied A.J. Brown type. Who was the receiver that Brandon Bean targets? I got to believe, Field, the Buffalo Bills are aggressive and move up. Maybe not in the top 10 to get an Aromo Dunes, they say, but certainly up from where they are to get one of those receivers I just talked about around that 20 to 23 area. No two ways about it. Buffalo feels like they scream the possibility of moving up. Minnesota, we've talked about plenty of times already here, Mel, so it wouldn't surprise me if they want to move up, of course. And then here's where I think things get a little bit interesting, Mel. And I don't have a specific team in mind because it's going to be dependent upon how things shake out. But once we get to the Tennessee Titans at number seven, we could see a world in which Joe Walt, Troy Fautanu, Tali Fuaga, J.C. Latham, Olu Fashionu all get taken in like a, I don't know, eight or nine span pick, right? Starting from seven and going all the way until 16 or 17. The Bengals, as an example, number 18, also very much looking for that offensive tackle market. One of those teams might be saying to itself, we don't want to miss out on our guy. We want to move up. I know that the public grades these offensive tackles very similarly, but it wouldn't surprise me if we had a bit of an arms race in that early teens range to move up for one of these tackles that a team really, truly prefers. Let's get to the next question, Mel. Who do you think has the toughest decision to make on day one of the NFL draft? I think it's the New York Jets have a difficult decision at 10 because you have a situation where do you get Aaron Rodgers another weapon, okay, or do you continue to fortify the offensive line? The offensive line, they brought in some guys who are older. Think about those tackles, 33 years of age with an injury history, right? Vera Tucker's had injury issues, okay? So do you go for the offensive lineman, like say a J.C. Latham from Alabama, right? Or do you take a Brock Bowers? Or, not having a two, do you trade down? Do you trade down and try to, for Joe Douglas, general manager, acquire some more picks by moving off of that 10 spot, knowing that some of those linemen that you talked about would still be on the board possibly? I'm not talking about moving way down, but move down five, six spots, Field, and Brock Bauer's still there. And those receivers after the top three, still there. So they would have a decision make at 10. I still think Brock Bowers has to be heavily in that decision making. You mentioned Fautanu. I talked about Latham. There's going to be options there. If they only have to move down four, five, six spots, they're pretty sure they're going get one of those guys, with Bowers or one of those linemen. So yep. it's going to be really interesting to see what Joe Douglas decides to do at 10 if he gets a great offer to move off of that pick. All right, so I'll go with the Arizona Cardinals, Mel, because they currently sit at number four, and we believe that teams are going to be angling to move up to pick number four to craft a quarterback. Here is the risk that I think that Monty Austin for their GM runs, is that we know if he moves down from four to, let's say, 11, where Minnesota is, he is going to get a mountain of picks. And with a team that still has a lot of needs and that still has a quarterback who, although he's been around for a while, is young enough where you can play a little bit of the long game here, Mel, you may say to yourself, acquire as many assets as possible. 
But go check out that wide receiver depth chart right now, Mel, and it is not going to scare anybody. And while this class has so much depth at wide receiver, I believe, and I don't feel like I'm speaking, uh, I don't feel like I'm being out of turn and speaking for you as well, Mel, the difference between wide receiver three and wide receiver four is significant. Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, all should become special players. There's a chance that A.D. Mitchell and Brian Thomas get there as well. But those first three, to me, feel like it's about as safe as it gets in the NFL draft. If you move from 4 to 11, I think you're missing out on all three of those guys. So if you're Monty Austin for it, can you pull a remix of what you did last year? Move down from 4 to 11, but then have a team that you're trading up with already, like they did last year when they moved from 3 to 12 to 6. Mel, I think it's a complicated process for the Cardinals. Yeah, I think those three are special. And then you were right. There's mixed opinion on a Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU about how good he can be. Xavier Worthy at 165 pounds. You're a skeptic about that field. I love <laughs> Xavier Worthy from Texas, but you're right. There is a, a nice gap between if you want to go Odunze as the third receiver, which is splitting hairs between him and neighbors, and splitting hairs between him and, and Marvin Harrison Jr., but they are three elite guys. The fourth guy, there's a separation. So I'm with Arizona. I don't think can afford to move off that pick. If they do, they're losing those three stud receivers. Yeah, I would feel only – I feel good about it because of the trade assets that you would be uh, – the draft assets you would be acquiring in that trade down. I would feel great about it if they had a second deal already lined up. 4-11, to 11-2, and I'm just making this up here, people. Just making it up. 4 to 11, 11 to 8. Hey, at 11, number 8, we feel great about one of those three guys being there because we know that four quarterbacks are going off the board already. All right, there's our plan. We're executing from there.